Hello everyone and welcome to our the second installment of the Act Innovate e seminar series. Um, a bit earlier today, but uh, lovely to see so many people in and listening. So um, this morning we are joined by uh, Dr. Willawan Kumsiri from Thailand and uh, Anne van der Meer from the Netherlands. So a true, truly global gathering today. Um, first up, we're gonna have uh, Juan speaking on uh, some new linear uh, lipopeptides. So without further ado, over to Juan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Like, my name is Whitley Wan Kum Siri. You can call me Wan. I think it's easier. I am the postdoctoral researcher from Actinobacterial Research Unit from Kasesa University from Thailand. So today I would like to give the talk in the topic discovery of the new linear lipopeptide from Streptomyces KO7888 by activation of a sub regulatory gene of a cryptic an RPS gene cluster. So I think of you may know about the first antibiotic that is penicillin. The penicillin was discovered in 1928 and then it has been developed to be the first antibiotic. After that, our life was changed forever. And the number of new antibiotics was increasing, especially in 1950 to 1960. That called golden era of the antibiotic of the drug discovery, because the number of new antibiotics have been discovered as an exponential trend. Unfortunately, the number of new antibiotics have been declined since 1990 until now. However, in 2015, Professor Campbell, Professor Umrah, and Professor Tu won the Nobel Prize of the ivermectin discovery that had been developed since 1978. So this prize is mean we still need the new compound that could be lead to the new antibiotic in the future to battle with the pathogenic bacteria and antibiotic resistant bacteria. So this study we're working on the actinomyces is this the gram-positive filamentous bacteria. This bacteria is the major group of antibiotic producer because over 70% of the commercial drug have been isolated from the actinomyces. For example, erythromycin, streptomycin, biomycin, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, and nystatin. And since the genome sequencing project has been launched, the genome of actinomyces also was analyzed. The genome of actinomyces harbor a large number of bioosetic gene cluster, and more than 70 and more than 50% of bioosetic gene cluster has not been reported about their product. For example, these three genomes represent the empty box that represent that are the cryptic bioosetic gene cluster. This cryptic biosynthetic gene cluster might related with the biosynthesis of the new compound. But how could we activate them to be expressed? There are various methods to activate the cryptic biosynthetic gene cluster to be expressed. For example, like heterologous expression and activation of the positive regulators. Activation of the positive regulator could lead to the new compound discovery. For example, like stembomycin discovery, but there are a lot of transcriptional regulators in the bacterial genome. These two regulators, including LASR regulator and streptomyces antibiotic regulatory protein family or SARP regulators, show the positive regulation result to the natural product from actinomyces. For example, the last R regulator could induce salinomycin, picromycin, natamycin production, and the subregulator also can induce the, pos the positive regulation of dosorubicin. So in this study, we try to overexpress the subregulator from the actinomyces genome. So the genome of the streptomyces was analyzed and predicted by osetic gene cluster and potential transcriptional regulators. And then the transcriptional regulators was overexpressed 
and observe the production of the candidate compound. After that, we back to the biosynthetic pathway to prove that the candidate compound was expressed from the biosynthetic gene cluster. This work we're working on the genome of streptomyces KO7AA. This streptomyces was reported about toxazolin B, C, and D production that show anti phytopathogenic fungi. So, this genome was annotated by RAS server and predict, yeah, and predict the secondary metabolite gene cluster by anti smash. The anti smash review 25 biosynthetic gene cluster that represent in this circle. And there are a lot of cryptic biosynthetic gene cluster in the genome. One of those cryptic biosynthetic gene cluster is non reposmal peptide synthetase gene cluster. And this gene cluster have not matched with any other biosynthetic gene cluster from the database. So this gene cluster may encode the production of the new natural product. So we look at the potential transcriptional regulator, we found SPER gene that encode the sub regulatory gene. So we try to over express this regulator into this host. After we got the recombinant strain. The recombinant strain was grown on various medium to observe the production of the candidate compound. And then the culture broth was extracted by ethanol and observed under LCUE. The LCUE chromatogram revealed that the, candidate, the recombinant strain could produce two candidate peaks. So we gave the name as subpeptin A and subpeptin B. But the wipe type and empty vector control have not been produced these two compounds before. So we still keep growing the recombinant strain to gain the high yield production of this candidate compound on YD medium for three liter. And then the candidate compound was extracted from the supernatant and applied into HP20 column chromatography. And the extract and the compound was extracted by methanol and applied into silica gel column chromatography and ODS column chromatography. This result showed that the ODS column chromatography could elude the candidate compound that represents in this figure. At the final step, this compound was purified by preparative HPLC and elucidated their structure by NMR analysis, high resolution ESIMS analysis, IR analysis, and advanced Murphy method. Interestingly, both subpeptin A and subpeptin B are new linear lipopeptides from actinomyces. The structure comprises decadienoil structure and heptapeptide. The heptapeptide including 2 glycine, hydroxy aspartate, L-tyrosine, L-trionine, and the leucine and hydroxy aspartate. So, overexpression of the sub regulator could activate the production of new linear lipopeptide from the streptomyces. So, at the final step, we try to predict biosynthetic pathway of the subpeptides. The structure of subpeptins corresponding to the product of the non reposmal peptide synthetase. So, the non reposmal peptide synthetase gene cluster represented in this figure that show the SPER gene that we over expressed located adjacent to the cluster. The non reposmal peptide synthetase could synthesize the peptide chain using adenylation domain for amino acid to select the amino acid. And then the catalytic domain will catalyze the peptide bond formation between each amino acid and give longer peptide. So in this study, decanoic acid was incorporated into acyl carrier protein or ACP. And then the decanoic acid was oxidized by acyl CoA dehydrogenase gene and give the decadienoil structure after that, the decadienoil structure was transferred into non-reposmal peptide synthetase module. Then, 
two glycine was incorporated into the intermediate. And hydroxy aspartate, l tyrosine L-threonine, and L-leucine were incorporated into the intermediate also. After that, the hydroxy aspartate was incorporated into the intermediate, and the L-leucine was epimerized by epimerization domain or E domain and give the structure of D leucine. And then glycine, proline, two glycine, alanine, and glycine was incorporated into the intermediate and make tridecap peptide chain. The tridecap peptide was at the methyl group at the last glycine by methyl transferase domain or MT domain. After that, the Tridecap peptide was released by thioesterase domain. And this peptide was hydrolyzed at AMI residue and give the structure of sapepin A and B. So from this study, we found that the genome analysis of this streptomyces review varied cryptic biosynthetic gene cluster containing the transcriptional regulator that encode the biosynthesis of the new compounds. The sapeptin A and B were activated by overexpression of the SARP regulatory gene from this streptomyces. And this structure of the sapeptins corresponding to the non reversible peptide synthetase gene cluster that show the gene that we overexpress located adjacent to the cluster. Finally, I would like to thank about the financial support from Thailand Research Fund under Royal Golden Jubilee PhD program and in RCT JSPS Joy Research Funding. This work has been done under collaboration between Actinobacterial Research Unit from Kasesat University and Laboratory of Microbiology for the Discovery at Kita Sato University under supervision of Professor Satoshi Omura, the Nobel Laureate in 2015. And I would like to thank you, Professor Peter Reilly, because the genome sequence has been provided from his laboratory from University of Cambridge. And thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Juan. That was <clears throat> that was brilliant. Um, I'll just while we're waiting for some questions to come through the chat, I'll just start off one that's uh, curious to me. Um, Mm -hmm. Have you looked at the in vivo activity of the uh, antibiotic you isolated yet? Yes, of course, I, I look at, but I I already test about cytotoxicity and some of the bioactivity, but unfortunately, my compound did not show any bioactivity and don't show any cytotoxicity also. And right now we're still working to analyze more activity because in our laboratory, we can have only some of the bioactivity assay. So right now we try to send our compound to analyze for other activities also. Well, thanks. Um, so a couple of questions from the, from the chat on YouTube. First mm -hmm. one, um, Hi, I wonder how have you obtained the isolate? Mm, oh, this isolate is not my for the streptomyces, right? For this streptomyces, it's not mine. It was isolated from Professor Omura. He isolated this strain in I think 1976 or 1978. Yeah. And he isolated from soil. And from this work, we try to use the old strain because it seems like we get a lot of the culture bank. So we try to use it for in many, I think we should apply to many objectives. Yeah. Well, um, Albert asks, uh, hi, Wan, thank you. Very nice talk. Which editing method did you use to overexpress the SARP? And also, do sarpeptins show any antimicrobial or other bioactivity? I think we covered the second bit, but um, which uh, editing method did you use? Uh, sorry, like, uh, I'm not get it. I, I think I think um, how did you overexpress the sarp? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry, sarp. I, yeah. Yeah, I'm over. Is I use the over expression plasmid. It's called like POSVE. Five five six three. I, I introduce it into the overexpression plasmid, and then this plasmid I transfer into the actin the actinomyces genome in the same horse. Just try to overexpress only single gene and mm -hmm. try to observe them what's happened. Just overexpress only one gene. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, Fabrizio asks, a uh, very nice talk. Can you please give me some more details on how you achieve overexpression of uh, SPE? Oh, we've covered that. Mo Morgan asks, um, any idea what might activate SPE are normally? Hmm? Sorry? What, what might activate this regulator normally? Do you have any idea? Um, do you mean like... Uh, what kind um, of signals do you think the strain's responding to? to to activate. Oh, okay. So, like, normally, you, you can play with them a lot. Like, for example, in, in my case, I try to I try to play with like positive regulators, and you can play with another regulators also. Like, at first, you can find any publication for positive regulator and try to always play them, and maybe you just try to disrupt some regulator. Yeah, maybe because some gene is not always spread because it's, it still have some repressor in, in the cluster. You just try to delete some of them and maybe you can get some compound, yeah. Did, did you find a repressor in the cluster? I look at, um, look at it, yeah, but I have not tested, so I'm not sure is this repressor or not. So I, I cannot tell you like, it should be repressor or trans or activator because I have not tested it yet, so yeah. Yeah. But I, I also found another transcriptional regulator is the BIOS FPG cluster. Okay, brilliant. Um, and uh, Sam asks, uh, how specific are these regulatory proteins and might they activate clusters in other organisms? Mm. Um, I have not tested this, but yeah, it's a good idea to, to try it. And yeah, it's to like, for example, you can try to put this regulator into the other but also the gene cluster, you can make like, you can make like the, but the genetic engineering just put the regulator that you already test is effect with the biosetic gene cluster, then you interest, maybe you can get the good compound So yeah. Um, fantastic, thank you very much, Juan. Um, yeah. We'll now move on to our uh, second speaker, uh, Adam van der Mel. In the Netherlands, uh, speaking on the impact of plant hormones on growth and development of actinobacteria. So over to you, Anne. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me get my slides up. Uh, yes. So yeah, thank you for the actinobase uh, team for uh, organizing this uh, e-seminar series. I'm really happy to uh, present the work I did during my PhD here, which is um, about plant streptomyces interactions. And um, we study these interactions for two main reasons. First of all, uh, quite often, or more and more, we see that uh, actinobacteria, and in particular streptomyces, are associated with the plant's microbiome. However, we, we do know very, very little when it comes to how the, the two grow together. How the, uh, how the plant associated lifestyle of the bacterium is. And secondly, um, we hope that we can learn from these interactions and harness them for the discovery of uh, novel antimicrobials. And I hope by the end of this talk, you uh, understand what I, uh, what I mean uh, by that. So um, my project was part of the Back to the Roots uh, program. And Back to the Roots is a Dutch consortium of uh, different research institutions and Dutch seed and plant companies. And together we try to um, um, explore and exploit the plant microbiome um, uh, for better plant growth. And uh, of course I didn't do this uh, on my own. Uh, first of all, I had two very, uh, very nice supervisors, Gilles van Wezel, a real streptomyces expert and Jos Rijmakers, a real plant microbiome expert. And I was also lucky to have Somaya El Said on the, on the project. She's a really good natural products chemist. Joost Willis, uh, who I did a lot of the imaging together with me. Uh, Chao Du, who um, did uh, quite a lot of proteomics. And Victor uh, was very important for the bioinformatics part. So, before I continue about the plant-associated lifestyle of, uh, of streptomyces, uh, I first want to um, share with you their uh, life cycle because I think that's it's important to have this clear to understand the rest of my of my talk. 
So streptomyces are multicellular bacteria, but uh, in general, they, they start from spores. And when conditions are favorable, these spores, spores start to germinate, forming a germ tube. And then by uh, tip extension and branching, it forms a substrate mycelium. Um, however, at some point, point, the bacterium will run out of nutrients. And this is uh, a signal to the bacterium to start reprodu uh, reproductive structures uh, in the form of aerial hyphae. Uh, however, it is thought that it needs nutrients for this, and therefore it releases a part of its own substrate mycelium, um, thereby having the nutrients to uh, build aerial hyphae and spores. Um, so the idea is that then at the same time, streptomyces start to produce antimicrobials um, to keep away competing uh, microbes. And this antibiotics production is of course uh, very nice for, uh, for us in, in medicine and biotechnology. So once the, the streptomyces has completed its life cycle, uh, there are spores again, and these, these spores can uh, disperse into the environment and this environment can be quite diverse. So typically streptomyces are referred to as soil organisms, but you can find them in, in uh, marine and freshwater systems as well. Um, and they're also increasingly recognized as interaction partners of eukaryotes. So uh, think uh, of, of sponges, fish, um, uh, insects, uh, or last week, Dr. Rebecca Devine uh, told us about some uh, and associated streptomyces species. And what is uh, particularly uh, interesting for my work is that we also find a lot of streptomyces uh, in and on plants. So one of the things that I did uh, during my PhD was uh, isolating streptomyces species from a sterile Arabidopsis plant that were grown in soil. And uh, we obtained uh, quite some isolates and when looking at the 16 S sequences of this uh, morphologically diverse uh, species, we found that quite often they would cluster within the Streptomyces clavifer or Streptomyces oligochromogenes um, classes. Um, and we did some, uh, some imaging of these species and it was really nice to, for example, see uh, spiny spores uh, appearing. However, this is all when you grow them uh, on plate. And we were really interested in how these streptomyces species that were recruited by this Arabidopsis would grow on the Arabidopsis itself. So we took one, uh, one of the isolates, uh, streptomyces strain COA1 for a Colombian associated one. It's this one over here. And we grew it together with uh, Arabidopsis. A sterile Arabidopsis. So what we did is we mixed uh, spores uh, of uh, the bacterium with seeds of the plant and we grew them on uh, agar specialized for Arabidopsis growth. And then we uh, uh, we stained the root with uh, toluidine which gives uh, it a blue appearance and we uh, did some light imaging um, on longitudinal sections of, of the roots. So uh, the, here is the top of the plant and here is the bottom of the, of the root. So what you see over here are, is the outer cell layer of the Arabidopsis root with root hairs appearing over here. Um, you can see uh, over here a, a letter-like pattern. This is the, uh, the protoxylum. And over here you can see all kinds of dots and lines, and this is actually the streptomyces attaching to um, the epidermis of the, of the Arabidopsis root. And if you zoom in, you can really see that this is the, the outer cell layer of the, of the root. Here you can see streptomyces, and it seems to find its way in, in, in between the cells. So for us, this was really promising, and uh, we decided to uh, move forward with elect electron microscopy to see this process in more detail. So we continued with uh, transmission electron microscopy, uh, and it basically allows you to look at a very thin slices uh, of, uh, of your sample, so around 70 nanometers uh, at, at high resolution. 
Um, so what you what you see over here is the is a plant cell or the plant cell wall, and over here this is a, a Streptomyces hyphae, and you can see that it's attaching uh, to the to the plant cell, and here we have a, a close up. So over here you can see some extracellular matrix. Over here there's um, there's the plant cell, and here we have Streptomyces. So uh, it seems that this Streptomyces species is attaching via an extracellular matrix. Um, but we also saw that uh, Streptomyces hyphae uh, could be found in between uh, plant cells and even in plant cells. So here we have the border of a, of a root cell. Uh, and then here we have Streptomyces. And again, over here as well. So this is the outer layer of the root, the epidermis, but you can see that it finds its way, um, it finds its way in between the cells. And over here, um, here there is the uh, a plant, um, the plant cell uh, border, the, the, the cell wall, wall. And here you can see uh, a Streptomyces hyphae appearing. Uh, in this plant cell, and this is uh, this was quite uh, nice to see because uh, we we it's never uh, observed uh, that there that, that there is really a hyphae inside an Arabidopsis uh, cell. However, um, we still don't really know whether this uh, plant cell uh, is alive. Uh, or whether the streptomyces really invaded the, the, the plasma membrane. Um, we also don't know whether, whether the streptomyces species uh, will still produce spores. So we do have the tools now to study the, the endophytic uh, life cell, but there are still lots of questions to be answered. Um, but in short, um, I think we can say that the streptomyces clavifer species and oligophagomogenins are plant-associated uh, species. Um, that our Streptomyces isolate colonizes Arabidopsis roots and that it attaches via an extracellular matrix uh, and that it's also able to invade the inter and intracellular space. Uh, however, the details on the endophytic lifestyle, yeah, they, they remain uh, to be solved. So apparently these, these plant Streptomyces interactions uh, are quite intimate and we think that at least in some cases um, both streptomycete and plant are uh, benefiting from this interaction because the plant is a very nice nutrient source for, uh, for the bacteria because it produces sugars and amino acids. On the other hand, uh, streptomyces are very good in the production of antimicrobials. So streptomyces might keep away uh, pathogenic uh, microbes. So the idea is that maybe when a plant gets attacked, it will get stress and send out stress signals that will stimulate the uh, bacterium to produce um, the pathogen attack. And um, we think that, that these uh, bacteria really need those signals because antimicrobial production is a costly process, so you shouldn't do it when it's not needed. Um, but in case the streptomyces perceives uh, a signal, it's happy to do uh, the production, because in this way it protects its own home. So what we wanted to explore next was the effect of plant compounds on antibiotic production by Streptomyces. And we did this in a very simple way. Um, what we did is we took uh, uh, big square petri dishes, which we filled with a, a minimal medium, and to this medium we added uh, plant material, plant hormones, um, yeah, um, so those kind of things. And uh, then we made spots of different streptomyces collections. So we tested, uh, of course, plant associated, associated streptomyces species, um, but also lab strains or just soil isolates. We let those uh, strains incubate for, uh, for a few days, after which we apply an overlay with an indicator. Uh, bacterial strains. So think of E. coli, bacilli, Staphylococcus aureus. And um, after uh, after doing this overlay, if you uh, wait for 14 till 16 hours, you can see 
that there are zones of growth inhibitions for your um, overlay bacteria. So over here, um, I did an overlay with Bacillus subtilis, and you can see that there is a zone of clearance around this uh, this colony, this, this Streptomyces, which means that um, there is something active being produced uh, against Bacillus. So if I do everything exactly the same, but just add jasmine to the medium, you see that this uh, pattern changes. So uh, for example, over here, you can see that there is antimicrobial activity, whereas over here, there is not. Um, it also happens the other way around. So sometimes there's inhibition when you add a, a plant a plant compounds, but we were uh, mainly interested in, uh, in examples where we saw some kind of induction. And the first uh, type of induction that I want to talk about is uh, induction of antimicrobial production by Streptomyces rosifacians, um, which showed a, a larger halo um, when grown in presence uh, of yosmonic acid against E. coli. And um, we were quite um, enthusiastic to see it in this strain because um, this strain uh, is quite well analyzed. Uh, we did some metabolic profiling uh, and in this way novel isocumarins were found. So it's a very uh, promising strain uh, and now there's potentially uh, or something extra being produced or something new. So we are now looking at the chromatograms uh, of, of extracts that were made from these kind of plates. And um, well, as you can see, uh, they are quite similar, but uh, not, not totally because over here, there's a peak appearing uh, that we cannot find under the control conditions. And what's even more exciting is uh, we don't know this peak from uh, our met previous metabolic profiling studies as well. So uh, Samaya is looking into this and uh, we hope to be able to report more on this uh, in the future. Another thing that was really uh, cool about this strain was that it uh, seemed to morphologically differentiate during jasmineate exposure. So here you can see uh, um, single colonies of the bacterium grown on a uh, minimal medium. You can see that it has a pink red uh, appearance and it's a bit fluffy. So you can understand why this is one of our favorite uh, uh, streptomyces uh, in the lab. However, when we grow them with uh, jasmineate, we would see yellow colonies appearing as well. And they also seemed less fluffy. So uh, decided to take a look at them uh, with light microscopy and there the change is, um, is visible as well. So normally you see that that there is uh, um, that these hyphae that they uh, branch uh, quite regularly um, but over here we, we don't see that branching as much and uh, there also seems to be bundled growth of, uh, of hyphae. So seems that they are sticking together. And you can see this even better uh, with electron microscopy. So you can really see uh, bundles of hyphae uh, sticking together, sometimes up to eight hyphae. Um, and we don't really saw this for the parental strain. However, we did observe uh, these very thick cables. So this is a zoom in of, of here. And it seems that from these cables, there are coming uh, uh, are splitting in multiple cables. So um, one way or another, it's a very interesting strain and uh, we'll be hearing more of this. Um, of course, we did some, uh, um, we, we tried to uh, elicit this uh, uh, yellow phenotype as well with jasmonic acid. And then we could actually see that the yellow phenotype of uh, streptomyces rosifacians does not enhance antibiotic production anymore in response to jasmate. So again, here you can see a, a spot of streptomyces rosifacians uh, under control conditions. Here with jasmate, uh, the, the halo is bigger, uh, whereas for uh, the yellow phenotype, this is not the case. Um, and when you put uh, a disc with uh, yosmonic acid in the middle of a confluently streaked plate, you can see that uh, the parental strain 
um, that there is growth inhibition around the disc with jessamate, whereas you don't see that for this yellow string. So um, from this, I think we can conclude that jessamate enhances antimicrobial activity of streptomyces roseofaciens. Um, we do not know yet what this is uh, causing, but uh, we're trying to figure that out now. And uh, a subpopulation of the streptomyces roseofaciens differentiates under jasmine expression uh, pressure, giving rise to this uh, yellow phenotype. So the last example that I want to uh, show you is uh, about the response of uh, streptomyces silicolor, our uh, lab uh, streptomyces. Uh, in response to jasmineates, because it responds uh, as well, as you can see over here. So what I did here is uh, I have spots of streptomyces silicolor um, under control conditions with jasmonic acid with uh, methyl jasmineates. So uh, jasmonic acid and methyl jasmineate are two variants of, uh, of the uh, plant defense uh, hormone uh, uh, of the group jasmineates, sorry. Um, and you can see that there is uh, increased activity against Bacillus subtilis uh, in compared to the control. And uh, when I do the same experiment with an uh, actinorhodin mutant, we don't see this induction anymore. So there's a high probability that uh, it's actinorhodin production that's being uh, induced um, in this uh, in this experiment. However. Uh, I saw something very interesting um, when, when working with the jasmonic acid in particular. So when I added jasmonic acid to a minimal medium, I could already uh, see uh, gray colonies appearing after two days. And this is an indication of, of sporulation. However, however, normally on minimal medium, you will see uh, spores appearing after three, three, but mostly four days of growth. Um, so, um, we decided to, to look in, into these spores in a bit more detail. So with electron microscopy, you could indeed see spores already after two days of growth. However, they look a bit messy. It seems that there are hyphae everywhere besides spores, um, especially if you compared it with um, normally grown uh, streptomyces spores, because this is after four days of normal growth. And if we zoom in, you can see that from these spores, there are, seems to be germ tubes appearing. I think over here it's a bit more clear, but I can't see it uh, on my screen uh, at the moment. Um, so it seems that uh, jasmines increase actinorhodin production in certain species see the color, but also stimulate um, sporulation and ectopic germination. So to get a glimpse uh, on the genes involved in the jasmineate response of uh, streptomyces silicolor, we did some uh, RNA uh, sequencing uh, experiments. So we induced uh, liquid cultures with, uh, with jasmineates and uh, went for RNA, RNA sequencing. And I quickly want to point out uh, one, one gene cluster that we saw was specifically upregulated um, when um, induced the culture with jasmonic acid, and those were the uh, RAC genes. And the RAC genes are uh, non-canonical developmental genes that trigger morphological differentiation. Um, they are RAM-R-regulated uh, genes, um, but the fun thing is that they are uh, chromosomally distant. So yeah, my question is, uh, does jasmonic, jasmonic acid boost development via these RAC genes? And, um, in order to answer this question, um, I made um, mutants of, uh, of uh, uh, several genes in this RAC cluster. They did it uh, with help of, um, of already available uh, cosmids. Uh, so um, what you see is the, the RAC cluster, or the, the, the RAC operon over here, and um, Reg A and Reg B are thought to uh, uh, to be encoding um, a transporter together, and um, if I look at the, the Reg B mutant, I can see that when I grow them as patches, it resembles the wild type. 
However, when I add jasmonic acid to the medium, I can see for the wild type that there is a clear enhanced uh, sporulation response, and this is not so visible for the RECB mutant. In addition, I looked at promoter activity of the operon, and basically uh, a more red color here means that the promoter is more active. So although uh, very slightly, you can see that there is a little bit more red production over here and over here. So these are uh, indicators together with the RNA sequencing data that these REC uh, operon might be involved in the jasmonet response. So uh, with respect to streptomyces sealy color and jasmonet, I think uh, I, I can conclude that uh, axinorhodon production in streptomyces sealy color is enhanced by jasmonates, and uh, we, you can see that the best for methyl jasmonate. And jasmonic acid triggers uh, early sporulation and ectopic germination in streptomyces CD color. And um, this is probably partly acting via the, via the so-called RAC genes. And uh, for the whole talk, um, my uh, take home or stay at home message is that plant streptomyces interactions uh, can, can intimate. And um, well, we, I think besides the, the well-known pathogenic uh, streptomyces, streptomyces scabies, we um, can also start looking at uh, beneficial interactions or opportunistic interactions. And um, well, we have some protocols available now that, that make that uh, a bit more easy. Um, I've also shown to you that plant hormones have impacts on antimicrobial production by, by streptomyces. It can be, uh, they can enhance antimicrobial production um, they can also in, inhibit antimicrobial production. And I think it would be really nice to see if, if certain plant compounds uh, activate certain uh, classes of antimicrobials um, in, in, in our streptomyces species. And I've shown you that jasmonates uh, can greatly modify streptomyces growth. Uh, I've shown you the example of streptomyces rosifacians, where we saw a, a yellow morphology appearing, um, but also in our model uh, organism streptomyces CD color, um, which shows um, accelerated development. So that's what I wanted to tell you for now. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask the, uh, to answer them now, or uh, uh, you can also find me later via email or whatever. Thanks, Anne, for a brilliant talk, and there were some really gorgeous images in there. Um, we've got some uh, eager questions in already. So uh, Gertie asks, uh, can you say something about the extracellular matrix composition you talked about near the beginning? So uh, yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, yeah, we, we were also really wondering um, uh, where this extracellular matrix comes from. So um, of course it could either come from the plant or from the streptomyces seed. Um, we don't know the composition. Um, we are thinking about working with uh, uh, Arabidopsis mutants and uh, Streptomyces mutants, of which we know that they have to do something with extracellular matrix. But uh, yeah, we haven't done that yet. So um, I'm, I'm afraid my answer is uh, no, I haven't looked at it, um, but it would be very interesting, yes. Cool, uh, another one. So you talked about how you're doing this uh, double overlay um, bioassay. Um, and uh, Smith asks, uh, you mentioned you put plant material in the agar as well as other compounds. How, how are you managing that? So um, the, 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 plant, the, the plant compounds I really add to the substrate agar of the streptomyces. Uh, and there I let them grow for, for like four to five days. So the streptomyces are really exposed to the plant hormones, whereas the uh, indicator strains are uh, in their own um, well, mainly uh, soft LB agar. Um, of course, uh, it is possible that some of the plant hormones will diffuse into the soft agar overlay. Um, however, I, I, I tested the effect of the plant hormones or the crude extracts of, of the plants um, while working with uh, uh, a vast, uh, while working with known amounts of antibiotics. So I tested whether these uh, plant hormones would affect antibiotic susceptibility uh, um, in the indicator strains. I, I don't know if that answers the question or... Um, I think it, it probably does. 
Uh, Kate Duncan asks, um, can you comment on the concentration of uh, the compound so jasmine added and did you observe a concentration dependent response of the bioactivity yeah so very uh, very good question yeah so um at the beginning uh, so so when, whenever we started working with a plant compound we made sure that we would uh, use a concentration range that uh, seemed logical uh, from from literature um, however, it's, it's really hard to determine the, the concentrations uh, of, of plant hormones that um, that the bacteria would be exposed to in uh, in a real world situation. Um, so, yeah, mainly we, we always looked for a concentration that uh, that did show uh, an effect, but did not show toxicity. Um, so this is different for for uh, this is different for different compounds, um, and in for jasmonic acid, um, we mainly worked with uh, ranges from uh, fifty to five hundred micromolars of, uh, of jasmonic acid. So it is it is in a way quite high, um, but uh, yeah, we did that. Um, but we had our reasons to uh, to do it. Cool. Um... So Hina is curious about the, the yellow colony, um, the subpopulation, uh, and asked, was this yellow colony confirmed with the sequencing in case jasminate allows growth of another contaminating actinobacteria? Yeah, so uh, again, a, a good question. Um, so uh, the reason why I'm fairly sure it's not uh, a contamination is because uh, we, did, um, we did already some first um, Metabolo metabolomic uh, analyses, and we could see really uh, overlapping chemical profiles. Um, so um, that's why I'm quite sure it's not a contamination. Um, and sorry, there was a second part of the question, I believe. Uh, no, I, I mean that that was uh, that was answering it. But I'm really curious if you plan to do any um, RNA seq between the two populations and see what's going on between them. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a really good uh, suggestion, and uh, yeah, I, I I really feel this is something we should do uh, in the future. Uh, however, I, I want to make I want to get to know the strain a little bit better because um, um, it seems it seems quite stable. Uh, so even without applying jasmine to this uh, yellow strain, uh, it will still remain uh, mostly yellow. However, sometimes I do see um, see it reverting back to, to a more parental phenotype. So, yeah, I, I really want to understand uh, what I'm sequencing or on what I'm doing the RNA sequencing. So, once we have figured it out a bit uh, more, uh, yes, that's definitely something we want to do. Cool. Um, time for a couple more. Scott asks, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Do you plan to test against uh, phytopathogens or just human pathogens? Yeah, it's a, a very, uh, uh, yeah, very nice question. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I did start some tests with uh, testing against uh, uh, phytopathogens, um, but um, quite often those are f uh, fungi, and um, yeah. I noticed that I really had to to work on a, a better screening system for um, for doing the same kind of uh, screenings with uh, with fungi. Uh, also, because quite often um, when you start working with um, uh, pathogenic fungi, they, they they tend to lose their uh, pathogenic uh, pathogenicity when when you grow them in the lab for a long time. So uh, it was a bit. Um, hard to, to draw any conclusions from that. And, and of course, it's always hard to, to draw uh, conclusions from lab results into uh, real life. But that's why I decided uh, in the first place, just to prove the, this, this proof of concept to work with an indicator strain that is a bit uh, easier to work with. Yeah, yeah, really good idea. Um, so uh, just on that note, because we've got so many more questions, but we'll run out of time. Um, as you can see, Anne's Twitter's up here. Um, I'm sure she'll be very happy for you to tweet her. Remember, use the hashtag actinobase02 um, for uh, the um, for for the questions, and I'm sure she'll get around to answering those. Finally, just uh, to say a huge thank you to both our speakers, Juan and Anne, today. Um, it's been fantastic having you. 
and thank you everyone for listening in. Um, finally, before I go, um, next week we are lucky to have uh, Dr. Rebecca McHugh from uh, the University of Strathclyde and Jan Falguera from the University of Toronto speaking next week. Um, so please uh, join us then. It's 6 p.m. BST, a later one for our uh, um, friends across the pond. So uh, thank you again and we'll catch you soon. <laughs>